morning. Good morning. Thank you. Oh, you're not supposed to see this slide. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll explain it. This is my uh, test slide. Um, this because I'm a nerd. Um, you got to put this up to get a sense of are the colors right? You have the colors right? Um, get a sense of where the circles are so you can see how it's bounded, so whether you're cropped correctly. So we have a little cropping issue down here. Most importantly, you can see whether your font is installed. How do you do that? Futura is one of those is text, and the other one is a graphic. So if the font is wrong, you know your fonts aren't installed. Little known fact. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's my shtick now. Um, so I was in Portland, Oregon uh, about a year ago, and I had a talk I had to do called Leadership by the Numbers, which is the name of this talk. It was uh, two days before that talk, and I had this slide. <laughs> that's all I had. And I had this idea that I wanted to go and do this talk about all the interesting numbers that you need as you become a leader. How long until someone's fully up to speed? Um, how many one-on-ones to have? What percentage of your time coding versus being a manager? All of these interesting numbers. And I started that talk, and I realized I didn't actually have a talk. So this is not actually the name of the talk. I had a different talk in mind that we're going to actually go and do. I was thinking, OK, I've got to come up with something here. So I kind of started reflecting back on my past couple of gigs and kind of like what happened as I moved to those different, um, those different jobs. I was at Apple. I ran the Apple store for three and a half years. I worked at Palantir for three and a half years and did creepy things. Um, and then I went to Pinterest, which was decidedly not creepy. And then finally, about seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago, I landed at Slack. But that was a little bit before this talk. The talk that I wrote was before Slack. And I was kind of just going through and trying to figure out what are the things that really matter? What is like the inspirational thing that I can say about leadership from all of this? How can I write this great talk? And I've written a lot about this. Pretty smart guy, wrote a couple of books, learned a lot of lessons, told these stories, shared them with all the humans. Pro tip, that's the new cover for the book. It's coming out, the first one to see it, third edition. I've written all of these things. I've got to like have this amazing talk. I've got to have this talk that's going to dazzle you and just knock the socks off you. So I'm thinking, okay, what is that theme? What is the one line? What is the poetry? Where is the wisdom? How can I pull it together? And I said, well, you know, let's simplify. Let's narrow it down. So I play this guy on the internet named Rands. Rands is my wife's maiden name. True story. And he's this guy on the internet, sounds like a fortune cookie. And he sits there and he writes 140 character condensed wisdom. Here are a couple of recent gems. Saying no is a finite resource. Busy as a bug, it's not a feature. Be unfailingly kind. We'll talk more about that. So is this at all useful? You get a tweet, maybe you follow me on Twitter, I don't know. We get these things, does it actually help you in your day? Maybe, a brief moment of inspiration. I like Twitter because it forces me to force as much wisdom into 140 characters like as I possibly can do. It's, I'm an engineer, I'm trying to be efficient, I'm trying to deliver as much value in as few words as possible. So it's fun. But is it useful? I don't know. I'm thinking, I've got to do this talk, I've got to write this talk. It's got to be like inspirational. So I say, what is the thing, what is the most important thing you should do as a leader? Shout out, something, anything, one word answer. Inspire, Inspire people. What was that? Oh. Talk. <laughs> Speak. <laughs> I really want to do something here real quick. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> nice! <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, focus up here, people. Up here, focus here. Okay, so talk, inspire, speak with people, try to stump the translator. Um, it's it, here's a great one. Your job is to inspire the team. It's a great tweet. Start big. Have a master plan. Have an 18-month roadmap. This is where you think you need to start, but I think it's actually more important. And that's what we're going to talk about is to focus on the basics. The thing that I realized, and I was running out of time, is the thing I really wanted to focus on were what are the basics of leadership. And I realized, I had this talk, 
I call it the vegetable talk. Eat your vegetables, right? Very healthy for you. Your corn, your tomato, not a vegetable. <laughs> Broccoli, <laughs> carrots, <laughs> and potato, there you go. So let's get to know you a little bit before we start here. How many of you, wait a minute, engineers, raise your hands. Any kind of engineer? Oh, kind of, it's a lead developer, you think it's about to, uh, QA, are you in the room? In the back? HR, are you here? Sweet, okay. <laughs> awesome, okay. So, oh, sorry, uh, managing from six months to one year, hands up. Okay, about a quarter, uh, one year to five years, managers. Okay, five years to like me. Okay, nice spread, okay, good. Okay, here's the thing that you're gonna learn. There are these things that happen to you as a manager. These are merit badges. Um, merit badges, are we familiar with this concept? Boy Scouts have them, Girl Scouts have them. You go, you learn how to make a fire, and they give you a little badge with fire on it, and you go, hooray, I know how to make a fire. Um, <clears throat> there are these things that are gonna happen to you as a manager, and what I would love to give you the ability to do is to prepare for these things, and they're awful. They are horrible, and you'll know about halfway through that they're happening, and you're like, oh crap, this is horrifically bad. <clears throat> they are, just so you know, you're gonna have to tweet fast. These are some of the things. Influence without management authority. Delegate something you care about. Hire a human, fire a human, put a human on a performance plan. Successfully deliver horrifically bad news. Successfully receive aforementioned horrifically bad news. There's more. <laughs> Lay someone off, be deposed, ship a thing, ask for help from an enemy. I love this move. Promote someone, sit there calmly while a human loses their mind. <laughs> I did that like three days ago. Um, lead leaders or fail spectacularly. These are all things that are gonna happen to you and I would love to like give you a tweet or a set of wisdom that to, to help during this, but and I, as, as I was sitting there working, sitting, sitting in Portland worrying about this, I realized what helped me during, when I received many of these merit badges was focusing on the basics, on the vegetables. So that's what we're gonna talk about. These are simple things for you to do. We're gonna focus on the simple things. It's common wisdom. The section has range, this talk has range. If you're a new leader, these are the basics, the blocking, tackling. I wanna infect you early, I wanna inoculate early about what good leadership looks like to me. And for the seasoned leaders, for those five to 10 or more folks, I want you to remind, I want you to want, to, I want some common sense, remind you some common sense that you maybe have forgotten and why. So welcome or welcome back to leadership. Excellent. <laughs> the view is pretty sweet up here, right? I'm a leader, right? Here's some wonderful things that happen because I'm a leader. I have good visibility to a great many things. All this information's coming around me. Um, there, I have a responsibility for all of these humans that I'm working for, the humans, the process, the product, all of these things. This is great, and I have all this ability to affect change because I'm responsible for all these things. But the thing about the gig that you quickly learn is that this pyramid is actually upside down. This is how it actually plays out. There's this focusing effect that happens because you're a lead, because you're a manager. All of the people, their problems, their process, their highs, their lows, all of this ends up on your plate. The rude way to describe this is that shit rolls downhill, and it does. So what are we gonna do about this? We're gonna talk about the first vegetable, which is communication. Talk, who said that in the back? Your job is information gathering, abstraction, filtering, and delivery. You have burden to over-communicate, to repeat yourself. The new managers, as you come into the gig, you realize, oh my gosh, I didn't know all of these things were going on. The experienced leaders are getting used to the steady flow of information. And the one thing, the only thing I need you to remind, that I want you to know from this talk, this is it. I could stop the talk right after this and we could finish, is to do one-on-ones. And I realized, this is when I realized I had a talk. I had this talk. Talk about one-on-ones. This is something that I do religiously every single week. And it's so obvious that I don't even think of doing it as an advice anymore. Your job is to remember there's more of them than you. A huge, ongoing, never-ending part of the job is to move a piece of information from A to B to C. That's your gig. Here's some tactics. 30 minutes every week, 
no matter what. 30 minutes every week, no matter what. Now, usually someone who works at Google raises their hand when I say this, and they say, Rand, Zlop, whatever your name is. Um, I have 42 direct reports, so or I'll, let's make it easy. I have 14 direct reports. That's seven hours, if you do 30 minutes, a, day, a week that I have to, have to do, like a full day of one-on-ones. And I look at them and I say, hmm, yeah, you're probably not managing or leading 14 people. You're probably only managing 10 or so. I have a rule on team size is seven plus or minus three. And those Google folks, any Google in the room? Sweet, okay, we'll make fun of them. Um, <laughs> all those Google folks, they like with these huge teams of like one manager with like 50 direct reports. The thing about Google is there's these vents in the ceiling at Google, and out of these vents pours money. <laughs> <laughs> Just keeps on pouring in, and that money covers up a lot of sin. It's working for them, right? They're doing okay, but from a leadership perspective, from a management perspective, I think there's a lot of folks in those one to 50 teams that aren't being managed, that aren't being led. 30 minutes every week, no matter what. I just started at Slack, and I'm trying to hit this, and I just kind of give a version of this talk at Slack, and I'm, I'm moving, moving around a little bit. I feel bad every single time I move a meeting because the thing you've got to remember about a one-on-one -on -one with your employees is very often for you, it's just another meeting you have to have. But for them, it's maybe the most important meeting of the week. So what am I going to talk about in these things? What am I going to do in this 30 minutes? Well, most engineers that I work with, they go into the first one with me and they say, okay, Lop, Rands, whatever your name is, um, Here's the seven bugs that I fixed, and these are the six, next three bugs that I'm gonna be working on. I'm like, stop, Let's stop. This is not what we're gonna talk about. This is not what we're gonna do in this meeting. It's not about status, it's not about updates. I have Jira, I have Trello, I have Slack. There's a million ways for me to gather state about what's going on with my team. Those tools are there so that I can go figure out what's going on. A one-on-one -on -one is an opportunity to have a conversation about whatever's important that week. And if it's not obvious in the first minute, here's three things you can do. Number one, whenever I go into one-on-one, -on -one, I have three things that I'm gonna talk about. I don't know what they are, but the important thing is I spend a minute before I walk into that room and say, these are the three things I wanna talk about. I am prepared, past conversations, current worries, whatever that is. If you don't do that, here's another one you can do. Performance review, performance management. Okay, last time, six months ago, performance review, we worked on you being more assertive. How's that going? I saw this thing in this meeting two weeks ago, this didn't happen here. Let's turn it into a conversation about coaching. Okay, don't have three points. Don't have a performance review. My favorite thing to do, because something's always blowing up, is to talk about my current disaster. Hey, this is a whole shit show over here. Let's talk, help me through this right here. Let's have a debate. I can coach, we can talk about it. We can brainstorm, maybe make progress. Most important meaning of the week. If it feels like a burden, you're doing something wrong. The other meeting is a staff meeting, excuse me. This is your directs. Um, I do this very similarly every week, no matter what, early in the week. It's seven plus or minus three people. And uh, the last version of this was at Pinterest. What we would do is hour long, executive team in engineering, first 15 minutes is metrics. What's going on in the world? Quickly, we're just gonna zip through it. Anything that looks off, 10 minutes. Maybe longer if something's gone weird. Then we do incidents, what happened with the site? Everything okay? Quick, just kind of status check. We're done with all of that in 15, 20 minutes. So we got another 40 minutes. We talk about something that we're building around the culture. Something around what are we doing in terms of building the culture of the engineering team. Talking about a political situation, debugging a complex people problem. If you can't fill an hour with that, you're doing something wrong. There's tons always going on. It's not a reactive putting out fires meeting. It's a strategic investment in the future. Your staff meeting early in the week, right around all your one-on-one, sets the tone for the week. <clears throat> I'm, there's these humans out there, you probably have met them. Um, they're meeting infectors. <laughs> they just like wander around and it's like meetings just show up around them. <laughs> these are not good people. <laughs> That's what they do to try to move things forward. I'm, I'd sound like I'm like super pro on meetings, I'm not. I'm always trying to cut meetings off my schedule, but these two meetings with a one-on-one -on -one with your team and a one-to-many with your one-on-one -on -one with your individuals on your team and one-to-many with your team are the cornerstone of the week. At Apple, everything interesting happened in terms of setting the tone and the cadence of the week on that Monday because the rest of the week we were dealing with whatever we talked about there. All right, 
First vegetable, the potato. I think there was a talk on feedback, so I'm gonna zip through this one already. You are underestimating the long-term cost of saying the hard thing. Especially we engineers, we're super bad at conflict, we're super bad about interpersonal emotional dynamics or whatever it is, we are horrific at this. And this is costing us. I had this guy, I had this guy I hired, this is hypothetical, because I'd never talked, this happened, but it's not this person. I hired this guy named Jeff, and Jeff was great, amazing resume, CV. We hired him, he was, went through the interview process, just nailed it, he was great. First week, I'm in a meeting with him, and I see Jeff in a staff meeting or something like that, and he's like, he was, he cut someone off, and he was a little bit rude, a little bit assertive, and I was like, he's new, he's new, it's okay. You know, alpha nerd, blah, 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 whatever. So I didn't do anything about it. I didn't say anything, because like, I don't want to like come in as a dictatorial engineering manager type, so I just let it go. And like three weeks later, someone comes by and they say, listen, um, I was in this meeting and then Jeff cut, this, uh, cut Bob off and it was kind of this weird minute. I don't think it's a big deal, but like, and I, and I went, oh, yep, I saw that too, that's interesting. Maybe I should do something about this. And then three months later, Three months later, someone in a completely different part of the business walks over and says, hey, Wop, Rams, whatever your name is. <laughs> uh, you have a problem with Jeff. This is four months. And I'd heard little things, little small things, and I was like, oh my gosh, I actually have a huge issue here. You're underestimating the cost of not saying the hard thing at the right time. There's a huge, what's the cost here? How do we quantify this Jeff situation for me? There's the obvious cost, right? There's, so suddenly I'm aware that there's probably not work getting done because people are probably starting to avoid this Jeff guy and it's like, I don't want to worry with them, so productivity's hitting a hit, taking a hit. Team morale's actually taking a hit because suddenly there's this part of the organism that's becoming a little toxic and people are like, why is that allowed to exist? And then there's your sanity because suddenly you're starting to disproportionately focus on this one person. That's the stuff, that's the easy stuff. But the thing about these situations, the thing about collections of humans is that you're always underestimating how much of other effect there is going on this person. There was Jeff on the team with me and other folks. There was Jeff cross-functionally. There was Jeff with entirely other parts of the team. I had a really serious Jeff problem. And this is the thing about it. <clears throat> Your credibility is taking a hit. Because everyone's wondering, why in the world isn't LOP, brands, whoever, <clears throat> actually doing something about this? There's always a larger impact on the people. That, you're only hearing about the things you see or the people that happen to find you to talk about the Jeff situation. So it's always larger than you expect. And you have this sanity problem on the team because they're like, what is going on here? Why are we dealing with this? So this is the hard slide. Whew. So um, sidebar, uh, corn seed is actually a vegetable, a grain, and a fruit. <laughs> what the shit? That's amazing. Corn seed is a vegetable because it's harvested for eating. The reason I'm saying this now is I put this up at a prior slide and someone's like, uh, hello, Rans, Lop, whatever you name. This is, not a, this is not a vegetable. It is a vegetable. Let me tell you. Corn seed is a vegetable because it's harvested for eating. Corn seed is a grain because it is a dry seed of a grass species. And corn seed is a fruit because that is the botanical Definition. I'm trying to distract you from this kind of big statement up here. Because <laughs> you're like, holy shit, is it just like, is it the LOP move is just to like fire people? Sweet. Great leadership, LOP. Um, <laughs> this is not actually the advice. The advice is on the next slide. And I realized this after I gave this talk. I did, there is advice here. There is advice here. We get very wound up around. And remember, this is Jeff who is adding value and getting things done. It's not an obvious, like, horrible situation, which is an easy situation to let someone go. It's like there's value. He's doing something, right? And there's this, cap, there's this toxicity and this cost around it. But we get wound up about the humans around us. And the thing about it is there's a point you have to be able to consider the world without this human here. You have to be imagine that. And that's usually what gets in my way is I have the value being created, but I have this tax around them. I can't imagine the world without them, so I let it go on too long. And the thing that I've learned in terms of letting folks go is that everyone is replaceable, including me. Including me, right? 
Nature abhors a vacuum. Every time that I've gone through this process of letting someone go and gone, oh my God, I can't imagine this person not being here, it's created a gap that's been filled by someone else who didn't, couldn't exist with that person there. And they suddenly have an opportunity to rise up. But it's not actually advice. This usually means you as a leader failed about six months ago. You failed because you didn't say the hard thing. In that first week, I didn't give Jeff the cultural sort of alignment, like, hey, this is not how we act here at this company. This is not what our values are. There's times you're gonna have to let people go, but imagine a world where you're nipping it in the bud and you're talking to them, giving the feedback early on. So that's our corn. It's normal. It's normal. We tend to hire people that we're on the same frequency with. It's normal, it's easy, it's, it's low friction to hang out with people that are like you. This is normal, this is how groups of humans kind of gather together forever, right? I know we've talked about diversity elsewhere, but diversity is a no-brainer. And other ones, folks have said it better than me, but it's the right thing to do from a social justice perspective, full stop. Like, can't even argue that piece. But I had to go and explain this to a bunch of engineers about why I valued this to engineers, so I needed to give them numbers. And I have a longer talk about this, but I'll give you the very short version. How many of you have heard of the ash conformity experiments? One, it's, it's wow, only five, that's great. It's usually nobody. Um, so be surprised when I get to the punchline. It's a simple test. They took, um, using the reference line on the left, Tell me which one on the right is the same. I'm going to pick on someone. Mary, I'm going to pick on you. Which one is it? C. It's C? You think that one is that one? Are you sure about that? I'm the VP of engineering at Slack, and I'm asking you, are you sure? I've written two books. Are you sure that it's C? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being my foil. It is C, but you see what I did there? Kind of did the social pressure thing, like, hey, are you sure about this? And the thing is, in this experiment, what they did was they took eight humans, seven who were actors, and one who had free will. And they did tests like this, they did a bunch of them, and they just did it at random, and of course, people picked C, or whatever the one was for that one. But then what they did is they had one test where the free will person voted last, and the seven folks who were actors before them all picked the wrong one. So they were like, it's B, it's B, it's B, it's B, it's B. You've just seen seven people choose B before you. You're like. <laughs> it's an optical illusion, right? 75%, and I think it's pretty obvious it's C, 75% of participants, free will participants, made one error in their test. They followed the other seven when it was totally obvious. Have you been in that meeting? Have you been in that meeting? Everyone's like, hey, it's blue. <laughs> and you're like, it's fucking red. <laughs> and everyone's talking, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue. And you're like, it's fucking red. <laughs> it's, it, you've been in that meeting. <laughs> what you want, what the thing about diversity that's amazing is you're bringing other perspectives into the room. You're bringing people who are bringing different ideas and different backgrounds, and it's amazing because they say these things in the room that says, by the way, it's red, and you're like, oh yeah, you're right, it is red. We were all kind of just thinking it was blue because Lop said it was blue and he's a VP of engineering at Slack, so let's, this is the thing about diversity. This, when everyone talks about the more, the more productive teams and more valuable teams, what they're talking about is the ideas are being seen by a diverse set of eyeballs. And that's amazing, because you get all of these different perspectives. Ideas get better the more different eyeballs you see on them. So what I ask of you with your broccoli is to figure out how you want to be a diversity ally. It is incumbent on every one of us to carry our fair share of the burden of advancing diversity. It is not right to ask the people who are already disadvantaged to do all of the work and the extra work of advocacy. So figure out something. Figure out something to advance your cause for you. Educate yourself. I have tons of research and papers. It's a fascinating topic, and you're gonna have a happier, healthier team. So that's our broccoli. I have 15 minutes, okay. How many slides do I have? Okay, I might be a little early. 
So, <clears throat> number four. Our fourth, um, our fourth uh, vegetable is it's about setting tone and cadence. As new managers or existing managers, you're setting tone and cadence all of the time. How many of you have kids? All right, I have two, about half of you. Uh, Claire and Spencer. Spencer's taller than me. It's maddening. <laughs> I'm like, I remember the day I was sitting there and I'm like, hey Spence, what the hell is going on here? Um, <laughs> Um, but let's talk about Claire for a second. Claire, who is 14, um, is, um, has learned all my moves. I walked into her room about two weeks ago, and I was mad about something. I don't remember what it was, but I came in to give her a piece of my mind. And I walked in, I'm like, hey, Claire. And Claire looks at me, immediately knows what's going on, and says, hey, Dad, did you hear about E3? And I'm like, what? what, E3? E3 is a video game conference in the States. And she is into video games, like me. And she's like, yeah, Fallout uh, 5 is coming, uh, uh, Titanfall 2 is coming out, and they talked a lot about Destiny, and da da, da. And I'm like, trying to, I'm like, I see what you're doing here. And then I'm like, yeah, it was, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> that Destiny update was pretty cool. Did you see her about the Iron Banner stuff? And she's like, yeah, and she was like fully prepared, and she had all of this data. And we sat for like 20 minutes talking video games. And I walked out of the room, and I'm like, that was sweet. I really connected with my daughter. And, <laughs> And I, and I walk back in, and I'm like, well, how? I'm like, where did you learn how to do that? She's like, I learned that from you. <laughs> this move, it's the redirect, it's the bait and switch, whatever you want to call it. She learned this move, and I do this. I can tell the moment you walk in my office or near me, I know exactly what mood you're in because this is my shtick, high EQ, can like, detect these things. So I walk in, you're coming in a head full of steam, and it's not the time to talk about whatever that is, so we're gonna go over here right now and talk about something else that's your favorite thing. And my daughter watched me do this for years, and now is using it against me. <laughs> you're, this is the same thing as leadership. The thing about your kids, for those of you who have kids, the thing you learn is that they're learning all the time. They see everything, and you think there's learning moments, it's all learning moments. They're learning all the time. And as a leader, the same thing is going on. There's looking at you as like, what is right and wrong? What is allowed to happen in this situation? What are the rules? This is a, I don't know, if that's not a vegetable. That is, okay. <clears throat> so this is a simple one, but it's more illustrative than anything, which is start and finish meetings on time. Like I said, vegetables, the basics. How many of you have been in a meeting? You walk in, the meeting's at 10 o'clock, but everyone knows it's 10.05, right? We call it Apple standard time, right? Everyone starts about five minutes late, and if it's really interesting, the meeting, it'll go a little bit long. This is disrespect. This is inefficient. This is not a good social contract with your other humans. It's a little simple thing. Start a meeting on time, Finish meetings on time. How do you do this? You've got to run between meetings. Give yourself five minutes at the end. It sets the tone for the entire organization about respecting other people's time, about being efficient, about meeting commitments. I don't know if this is the one you want to do, but I would love if you could pick one thing to just go and say, this is a value, this is a principle, this is a thing that I want to infect to the organism, and you're going to be surprised. You don't have to say it, you don't have to do it, you just start acting that way, and what you'll see over time is the organism will start to follow you. My favorite one, fifth one. I guarantee, I promise you, you're horrifically bad at something. If you don't know what it is, look to your right, or look to your left, if you came with a friend, <laughs> and ask them, <laughs> because your friends will probably tell you. They'll probably say, yeah, lop, friends, whatever. <laughs> you, you're great at the poetry and the, the strategy, but your execution is not great, which is true. <clears throat> you're bad at something, and I want you to be, I'm gonna put up some words here, I want you to reflect on this. What is that thing, relative to leadership, that you're not really that good at. Horrifically bad is not the right way to frame it. It's that thing that you're always gonna get a B at. It's always more work. You can get it done, but it never feels like your superpower, right? 
been thinking about this a lot, and I think I, I kind of see when I do an interview for leadership, I look into three different buckets. Vision, which I'll explain in a second, execution, and judgment. So how, this is the things I'm looking for when I'm trying to get a size of what, a, of what type of leader you are. And I'll explain each of these. And I want you to reflect. Is this something that you love? Is this something which is hard for you? Is this something that you think you're good at that you're actually a B at? I don't know. Let's find out. Vision. Can, and this is, it's an interview. I'm thinking about it sort of as an interview. Can you describe a compelling future? Can you, is it, is it pleasantly unachievable? Because vision isn't what we can do right here. Vision's like this thing that we can do a long ways out. Is it your vision or is it someone else's? There's lots of ways to have vision, whatever okay, this right word is for you, but a leader must have some ability to either hear it and relay it or come up with it, otherwise they won't be able to lead. They, they can't paint this picture or this road forward, this path that I want to follow. Vision. Execution is actually a spectrum. On one side, there's strategy. Can you describe the way to the vision? These are the, road, these are the signposts, this is how we're gonna get there. Or, on the other end, is execution. Is can you read the signs and get to that spot? Can you explain how we might achieve this vision? Do you know the concrete steps that are going to move us forward? Can you point out the common pitfalls on the path? Can you tell me great stories about how you climbed out of those holes and moved forward? Do you understand? Do you understand for yourself, are you strong at strategy or are you strong at execution? This is really important because folks that are really good, they, they tend to, I, some people are both, these are awesome, great unicorns, but usually if someone's really good at the execution side or they're really good at the strategy side. I'm better at strategy. I will paint you a beautiful picture. I will say everything that we need to do to get there. But on the, I get to the execution side and I'm like, oh, I get 70% done and then it's boring because it's all the details of actually finishing, which are actually the most important part. <clears throat> but you gotta figure out where you fit on this um, strategy execution spectrum. And this is the hardest one to sort of define, but it's something that you can, if you think of your manager or a co coworker, is if, if vision is where we're going and strategy execution is how we'll get there, judgment is the deployment of the principles that we'll use to make decisions along the way. Does he or she have good judgment? Do you understand the values of the company? Can you explain them and their implications? Do you fairly and consistently apply these values? Your values must healthily intersect with company and teams, otherwise, there will be organ rejection. This is the thing I always worry about when buying companies and sort of bringing on new folks is do we have that sort of alignment of values? But really, it, you don't really know it until you see people use judgment, apply the values to actually get a sense of what there is or judgment, good or bad. They don't, these don't, for the values don't need to be, your values don't need to be perfectly aligned with your company. They just need to figure out how they, how they complement. So that's a lot. That's a lot. So let's just boil it down to a really easy vegetable which is delegation. After one-on-ones, especially for new managers, this is something that I really uh, espouse. That work, whatever that thing is that you think you're gonna get a B at, you're always gonna get a B at. And each time you delegate is an opportunity for someone else to learn. I was at Apple for eight and a half years, and the only reason I had a modicum of success at Apple was a woman named Laura Legro. Laura Legro is an engineering program manager. She's now a director at Apple and is famous and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but what, she, what we realized in about three months of working together was that I was great at the strategy piece. I could say this is what, where we need to go. This is how we're gonna get there. And she was great at actually making sure that we the, we, the team, actually got it done. Strategy, execution. And I wanted to control it all. I wanted to own everything. But I had to be able to delegate and say, Laura, you're better at execution. You can drive this thing forward. New managers have to figure out how to delegate. The classic blunder for a new manager is that when the shit hits the fan, what do they do? They go back, they regress to their skills that got them there in the first place. The site's down, so they, they know have the complete architecture in their head, so they get down to the terminal and they figure it out and they bring the site back. And you're like, thank God the site's back, right? 
This is exactly the opposite of leadership. Yes, we want the site to be up. I'm not saying we don't want the site to be up. But there's a time, that's an opportunity to teach someone else, to delegate to someone else, to allow them to gather the skills that you already have. Delegation is super hard for new managers. But even for experienced leaders, delegation is the antidote to becoming drunk with power. I, told, I did this inter interview for TechCrunch when I was at Pinterest, and I said, listen, my job is to lead myself out of my job. There's some morning I'm going to be waking up where I've delegated everything to everyone else, and I have exactly nothing to do, which sounds like a pretty sweet gig. <laughs> it never works out like that, because remember that pyramid? It's all pointed straight at me, and there's always something that's blowing up. There's always some disaster there. But I always work in the mindset of, how can I give this to someone else? Who else can own this? Who can learn from this? Who's ready to do this? Who am I willing to take a bet on? Delegation is a great way to build your team. It's a great way to build trust and respect on the team. And we don't do it enough as engineers, but we're kind of control freaks. We kind of want to own all the stuff. How many of you, last question, then we're gonna talk about video games. How many of you have had, not including today, formal leadership training, like some class? Yeah, about, what are you, like a third of us here? A third of us here. I asked Twitter this uh, a couple of months ago, and I said, Twitter, how many of you? And it was like 60% of the people had never, who are, uh, who are managers, who consider them managers of the humans, had had no training whatsoever. And I, I kind of fretted about that, and I worried about that, and I said, well, that's kind of sad. But here's the thing about our gig. The job is the education. This is why there's not a huge amount of, I think there can be more structured learning around it, but this is how you're gonna learn, is these merit badges, which are gonna show up and be awful, but this is how you're gonna actually go and learn, is the day-to-day -day job is how to um, be a better leader. This is why, while I'm writing books and doing talks and whatnot, I always have a job. I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna do this exclusively because that's how I continue to learn. That's how I continue to challenge myself, is the finding and discovery of all of these horrible situations. <laughs> there are days that it's just gonna feel broken. There are days when it's just awful. And if those days usually turn into weeks or months, um, one bit of wisdom I wanna leave you with is if you're in a state of constant reaction, and by the way, as someone who loves disasters and making the diving save, this is there's a lot of adrenaline in this situation, this usually means you don't have a plan and or you aren't that strategic and you want to figure out some sort of way. If it's constant reaction, if it's constant fire drill, if it's meetings, dealing with all the things, something is fundamentally broken. You gotta take the time to figure out what the plan is, how we're gonna actually dig ourselves out of this. Here are the three vegetables that I'm working on right now. This is what I'm doing right now. I have three. I'm at a new company, I'm figuring out how it works, I'm trying to understand the culture. One-on-ones are paramount. This is the way for me to gather data and build trust and respect with the team. I am delegating my horrificness, which isn't a word, but I like it. <laughs> I'm delegating anything, anything that's getting handed to me, I'm like, eh, is, this, is this what I should be doing here? And if it doesn't fit into that category, I'm like, this is, I really wanna make a good impression with you because I'm new here, but I, this, you're gonna get a B work out of me. Someone else is gonna be better at it. And I'm doing okay here, although before I got on a plane here, I signed up to something that I'm really bad at, so I gotta fix that. Um, <laughs> realize that on the plane. And then the other piece is the diversity piece. Um, it, for me, especially surrounded by engineers, I have to continue to explain in a quantifiable way why this is important. This is an ongoing battle that I have. So that's the thing I'm working on as well. And I want you to leave this talk figuring out what is that one thing you wanna work on. And that means I wanna talk about destiny. Anyone know what destiny, how many of you have played destiny before? What? I'm not big in the UK. Well, you have a wonderful world ahead of you, and uh, if you have a PS4 or an Xbox, um, I have this game that I call, it's called Destiny, and I play with this guy in Portland, Oregon, named DJ. You can play Destiny by yourself, but it's far more fun to play with other humans. In fact, for certain parts of the game called raids, you require more humans, six humans, in fact. More, you need to act as a team with these six humans in order to get things done and you know, defeat the bad people. There are some challenges to getting six people together 
on the internet. The internet is full of colorful people and personalities. <laughs> and raids are complex affairs, so someone needs to step up and lead or else everyone dies. It's called a wipe and it's bad. So someone has to step up and be a volunteer leader. A volunteer leader is someone who is doing it out of the kindness of their heart. There's no performance review. There's no threat of performance management. They have to lead from a volunteer spirit. DJ, and I'm not joking, I'm not joking when I say DJ is the nicest, common, calmest, kindest person that I know. We spent days doing virtual battles together, and DJ is unfailingly kind. He's unfailingly kind. You need to leave the raid after we've been at it for two hours to be with your family? Two hours. Raids take about two or three hours to do. DJ says, no worries. No worries. We'll find someone else. It's all right. Having repeated difficulty fulfilling your role as part of the raid, which is resulting in wipes, DJ, as everyone else is getting mad, DJ says, no worries. Let me explain this part to you one more time. Because he'll do it over and over and over again. While I'm sitting there yelling in my mic, what are we doing here? <clears throat> You've never played before, forgot to mention that before the raid began. <laughs> DJ's like, oh, God, I remember, and I haven't played this before, and you're, you're in for a treat. And let me explain how it works. Every time, months, Months, years of this. Want to practice part of the raid that you've never done before that would result in additional wipes? DJ's like, yeah, let's work on it together. Every time. It's a leadership model that lends itself to volunteer situations, but I ask you, whether this is yours or not, is it a leadership model for all situations? Be unfailingly kind. Seems like important advice today. You're thinking of an important leader, you're thinking of someone, uh, some leader maybe in technology who like walked into uh, an elevator, asked an employee, what are you working on here? Didn't like the answer and fired him on the spot. Have you heard that story? I've heard that story before. <clears throat> That's a good story. It's not good leadership. Be unfailingly kind. Happy leading. I'm Lop, the typeface is Sentinel, eat your vegetables. Thank you. Thank you.